Welcome to Cooking the Books. I'm Frances Cook. We've all heard about how COVID-19 forced us to do years worth of digital adoption in just a few short weeks. And now we've got some numbers on it. The Financial Services Council carries out regular research on what's happening with our money. And their just released report on the rise of digital investors is fascinating. 40% of us are either already using or planning to use micro-investing DIY platforms like Sharesies, Hatch or Stake. And it's not just the young'uns either, as there's a noticeable increase in DIY digital investing in all age groups up until about 60, where it does then start to taper off. There are downsides to this, though, with plenty of people worrying if this new surge in online platforms leaves them exposed to privacy problems or cyber attacks. And frankly, when we've already seen hackers go after the NZX and Waikato DHB, that's a fair concern. So here's what you need to know. News Talk ZB presents Cooking the Books with Francis Cook. I'm joined now by Richard Clippin, CEO of the Financial Services Council. Now, you've just released some research, very interesting research, and it was quite stark to me, really, that I feel like we often assume it's just the younger generation getting into the digital world and trying out investing for the first time, and particularly micro-investing, where you're putting in those five, twenty, a hundred dollars at a time. But you actually picked up quite a broad sweep, didn't you? Where People of all ages are looking at these digital money management tools, particularly digital investing. Why do you think that is? Kia ora, Francis, and thanks for having me again. Um, you know, we, we went into field this year to try and understand um, what, what changed with COVID in the way New Zealanders uh, thought about investing. And, and what's really interesting is that uh, the micro-investing platform, so the ability for consumers to access products and access investments, both through funds, but also through shares and through parts of shares, has just been, has seen a phenomenal take up. Um, and that's right across the age uh, spectrum. It's also right across the gender divide, although there's some interesting differences, both in ages and also in gender take up. But the overwhelming piece is that the rise and rise of the digital platforms, as we're calling it, um, feels like it's a, it's not a fad, it's here to stay, uh, and it's a fundamental shift on the uh, on the New Zealand investing plan, uh, 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 landscape. Yeah, what do you think was particularly so, I mean, it, it's very clearly stacked around the time of COVID becoming a worldwide force, the lockdowns. What do you think triggered this mass digital uptake then? Oh, look, I think there's a few things. I mean, one is, you know, um, uh, 12, 18 months ago, we all entered the dark uh, void of COVID and we were uncertain about our lives, we were certain about our jobs, uncertain about our health, you know, and, and, and as, as we had a lot of time on our hands, um, a lot of us were drawn into, well, so what are we going to do? Are we going to read, take up a hobby? Uh, well, it turns out a lot of people jumped online and started to um, try and better understand um, investing and investments. Uh, and also, you know, for those who had invest investments um, in the very peak of the COVID crisis, stock markets were plummeting. You know, and people were seeing their wealth, if you if you like, evaporate. But you know, with every uh, downside, there's an opportunity. And uh, a lot of people then said, "Well, I want to take advantage of that." So, so that's the people who had wealth. But but equally, there's a whole new generation, uh, digital natives, the under 37s. You know, our kids and grandkids who are really into um, trying out new technology. Um, and the interesting thing about the research uh, is that it's not only people investing through these platforms, but they're going there to have a play. They're going there to learn. They're going there to understand a little bit more about the investment landscape. So, so it's not just a, a tool for investing, although clearly is that. It's also a tool for engagement, for financial literacy, for building confidence in making financial decisions. And obviously, when we had lots of time through COVID, um, lots of us did that. And, and, and the more confident people got, the more they started to invest. And, and so it's been a, a really interesting insight out of the research. Yeah, it is really interesting that, isn't it? Because I think um, the micro-investing world, it's 
made things so much easier for the beginners. And that's what I really love about it is that it opens things up to people who have traditionally been locked out of the old school investing, where sometimes you needed $2,000 or $10,000 to even be in the game. And I, I still don't just have that much cash lying around at any one time. Um, and it's, it's quite interesting because often when I talk to people, they'll say, oh, you know, investing so hard, I've only got $5, but it's kind of the perfect way to start, isn't it? When it takes the pressure off and you're doing things $5 at a time and you can learn by doing. Um, and all of a sudden we've got all of these people who are embracing that. And what I thought was fascinating was even the people who we traditionally don't think of as going for these platforms, you know, you noticed quite a spike in people who are interested in this micro investing option all the way up to 60, which that surprised me. Yeah, and that's exactly right. So, you know, this is not just, uh, you know, this is not like TikTok for kids or uh, a, a place where a certain demographic place. This is fundamental and it's across all of New Zealand. And, and your point around making it easy, you know, if, if I go back to, you know, the very first conversation I had, which sadly is now last century, yeah, the only way to enter the market was to go and see a stockbroker, um, you know, who was a real person who would charge you a fee and based on their research, they would say you need X. But, of course, stockbrokers generally dealt with people with money, not people without money. So that accessibility point um, was, was really interesting. And then, of course, that transitioned into the rise of the online stockbroker. So, so you could now buy stocks and shares uh, through an online broker and, and made it a whole lot easier. So, you know, it, it feels it feels similar uh, in terms of where we're heading here. The interesting thing out of the research um, uh, is is um, the number of people, and it's now well into the 90% of all of us are using online banking, uh, KiwiSaver, engagement tools for our kind of more traditional financial services. But again, you don't have to go too far ago when, you know, you had a passbook and you go to a branch to do your banking. Well, uh, it turns out now that most of us do our banking um, through online platforms, uh, which started on a computer. It's now on an app on your phone uh, and that's ubiquitous. So the, the percentage around 90 odd plus percent of people using it on a regular basis, the, the, the micro investing platform um, uh, data is really interesting. And that is that up to 38% of New Zealanders either have used or intend to use a micro-investing platform um, uh, in, the, in the research period that we're just looking at. When you extrapolate that into the numbers, you know, we're talking just a tad under 2 million New Zealanders either have used or will use or consider you considering using a micro-investing platform. Well, that's no longer a niche play. That, that's pretty mainstream and that's pretty, uh, pretty phenomenal. I mean, that's that's a sea change difference, because I still remember not that long ago when this podcast first started, any time I did an investing or shares investing episode, I would get some hate mail every time from people saying, don't you remember 1987? You can't talk to people about shares. It's terrible. It's bad. It's, you know, whatever, you know, and, and it wasn't that I mean, it's not great to receive hate mail, but it's also, you know, this was coming from a genuine place from people that people were genuinely very fearful of the financial markets and of investing in this way. And I think, you know, that was only a few years ago. And I think, like you say, 2 million New Zealanders who are now either already doing it or actively considering it. That's a big change in a short amount of time, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. For like four years. So mm -hmm. the rate of change from when, the micro platforms, your sharesies and your hatches, you invest now started uh, as small businesses to now they're a key part of the landscape. And of course, there's a whole lot of people likely looking at their business plans going, well, if this thing's still growing and there's opportunity, how do we do more of this? Um, and, you know, some of our local, um, local players are now shifting offshore. So are they going? well, how do we build our businesses? And obviously global markets and, you know, Australia is a, a classic example. So, yeah, like fundamental shift. Just, just um, Francis, your point around risk is really important. Um, 
and and I think your listeners, you know, I think I, I think whenever you're investing, you know, it's not just the ability to access which is important. It's actually fundamentally understanding what you're trying to achieve, and that in part um, needs people to understand what their risk profile is, mm. because investments go up and down um, over the long period of time. Investing in shares will will give you a good uh, good return, but that's going to be interrupted by periods of sometimes extreme and significant volatility. So, it, it, you know, just because we got a new platform and a new shiny way to invest doesn't mean that we shouldn't um, spend time on the fundamentals and that is how much you're investing and what's your risk profile and why you're saving and what happens if the market falls tomorrow what are you going to do how should you think about that um, because I think you're right you know your listeners have memories all of us have deep memories of our wins but the pain of loss is uh, is is really pronounced in investing um, and, and people certainly need to think about that uh, when, when when they work on new tools and new platforms, for sure. Well, yeah, exactly. Because, I mean, I obviously love the idea of people getting interested in investing. And I think these digital platforms and the micro-investing, it's made it more possible for people, just like you say. All of that, wonderful. But there is um, a cloud in this silver lining where there can be downsides, right? Particularly, there's, there's downsides with the investing side. There are downsides with the digital side. And your research actually picked up on some worries people have around that, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. So if there are if there are headwinds, there's probably two headwinds that came out of the research. And it's not just a micro-investing one. But the first one, of course, is we're all now in the digital world, and so the key issue around data and trust, cybercrime, uh, people stealing your identity, people stealing your money, uh, is very front and centre through the research. So the take-up rate, whilst high and growing and runway is fantastic, people need to be really clear and careful about managing the downside risks. Um, and, and look, I think that's a question for all of us uh, from the regulator down, um, you know, having having trusted markets and trusted players and licensed players and consumers making good and informed decisions so that their money is actually secure. But that certainly came through through the research, um, you know, particularly not just on the micro side, but, but certainly um, in some of the data that came through on the cryptocurrency side, which, of course, is a different conversation, but very one, very much one uh, driven by you know, how do you trust um, that this will actually work for you and that your crypto will be available when you actually want to use it? So, so, so that, that's the one headwind. The other, the other headwind is kind of more a demographic one, which is making sure that um, all New Zealanders uh, get access to this technology opportunity uh, to invest. So it, it, just back to the, the conversation around the ubiquity of apps and um, uh, access for your banking, mainline banking, which is now pretty much everyone. Um, the take-up rate, obviously, on micro is higher for younger New Zealanders. So, you know, we need to make sure and find a way that we bring everyone on that journey, uh, younger, older, uh, diverse uh, groups, uh, and so on. So that investing, you know, is for everyone, not just for certain parts of the New Zealand community. So those were a couple of the key insights, yeah, that, that certainly turned up through the research. That's really interesting. Let's start with the um, cybersecurity side of things. I mean, is there a way that you can vet whatever platform you're using? Like you say, we haven't really touched on cryptocurrency. I feel like it's such a massive topic in itself um but obviously this is a big part of that where it's a new digital currency that people are interested in so it can be hard figuring out what's the best way to invest in that it can also you know people will even still contact me about um the the investing platforms like sharesies and hatch and say you know are they legit can they be trusted what are the fallback options how do people check that out so that they can see whether this is something that they're comfortable with yeah, look, I think I think that's the key the key issue. So the, the, the take up of new technology certainly has some risks. So you know, when you're investing, uh, are you investing with an organisation that's got a track record that you can go and research on the website? That's that that has people that you can access. That's licensed by the regulator. You know, the 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 landscape in New Zealand is uh, is one where regulation and 
uh, the Financial Markets Authority obviously has clear oversight of licensed entities. And so uh, if you're offering products and services uh, out into the public domain uh, and the requirement for licensing is high, then they've gone through and met certain hurdles uh, and oversight and the people who are running it are fit and proper people and so on. So I think the, the onus of, of, of who do you trust uh, sits in two sides, certainly one about the, with the entities who are offering the service they've got to jump through hurdles. But the second one, and, and arguably more importantly, is us, uh, who are the consumers. So like with anything, it's who do you trust um, and how do you make that decision to trust? Maybe you start small and you, you make sure it works, um, get a feel for how things are working, getting terms of reference and points of reference from colleagues and friends and trusted uh, trusted professionals and so on. Um, but, but in the end, um, you know, the stamp of approval from a, uh, from an entity that's been licensed by the regulator, uh, I think is important. Um, and, you know, with most things in life, if it, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is, and just be cautious. So I think, you know, I think the micro-investing conversation is a little easier because people are investing. They're investing in fund managers or in shares and in companies that exist through a platform that's now got a, a, a you know, track record, uh, is licensed. I think the more exotic you go up the investment curve um, uh, and perhaps uh, into certain cryptocurrencies and other other areas, you know, you just need to put on your uh, sceptical hat and get really detailed on your research. Um, the, other, the other piece that plays uh, here all the way through the research, not just in this research, but research we did last year, which is what's the role of advice, you know, for people to make good and informed decisions? And of course, that's different for different ages and stages, and depending on how much money you're investing. But certainly, getting good quality advice from a qualified advisor for those New Zealanders who want it and need it kind of becomes a, an important part because then you've got a, a guide and a coach kind of helping you on your way. But I do think this is one um, that, you know, cyber breaches happen from the very large to the very small, um, or it's, it's a now standard part of our life. Um, and I think uh, I think the way we all need to think about it as companies are thinking about it is um, it's it's not if but when. Mm -hmm. So you know there are enough people actively looking to part, uh, part us with our money and steal our identities and so on. The question is what are we doing actively to manage that risk? Because it's not if it'll happen; it's just when it'll happen. Um, and if we take that mindset then we're kind of protecting ourselves or we've got another layer of protection. So I think, I think this is going to be an always on discussion, to be honest, uh, given that the real cash and the real assets um, it almost feels like it's a part of another era. And we're moving totally into the digital world where this will become such an important issue. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's almost, there's, there's a couple of, well, lots of great points you just made there, but a couple I'd like to touch on is, you know, when you say there about it's not if, but when, I mean, I hope that doesn't scare people because I, I agree. Um, it's just, you know, we saw the NZX get cyber attacked. We've seen Waikato DHB get cyber attacked. Um, big organizations that should have protections. Um, and so, it can happen at any point. And this is why we see things like banks have insurance against things like card skimming, because that's another reality. And so I think things like insurance and plan B, you know, it's, it's just a reality of life that there are bad people out there and you have to plan accordingly. Um, and your other point around, you know, having to be licensed by the FMA, um, the Financial Markets Authority, Really good point there, because that shows you that, A, someone is having to jump through certain hoops to get licensed. They're more legitimate from the start. Um, and B, you have a, a, a place to go if something goes wrong. You know, they have registered themselves with our money police and you can actually check on the FMA website if the place that you are wanting to invest through is registered. So that's a really easy way to check. And you don't just have to take people's word for it. Um, 
It's it's like when you mentioned before about back in the day you used to have to go to a stockbroker and it was a real person. And another part of this digital change is the push for robo advice, which again, the FMA have just made that much easier to provide robo advice. You could technically do it before, but it was really hard. Now you can do it. Um, but people are a little nervous about it, right? That that showed up in the research too. Yeah. Um so, you know, robo-advice at a definition sense is, you know, you put in some details and out comes some guidance or advice. And it's basically, you know, computer-driven or algorithm-driven based on what you put in. So, so if you, it's, but, but it's absent kind of a human conversation where you can talk about your fears and your goals and your aspirations and so on. So, so for some people, I mean, and this is the, this is why the, the, the micro platforms are so uh, valuable and, and it's probably been by design, but in some ways the research is showing that it's almost an unintended benefit. So when people go onto these platforms and they start to play around, there's a lot of good quality information and education there, which is, you know, what is a, what is a share and what's a fund and how does it work and how can you buy a slice of it and what about dividends and all that kind of stuff. So then people start to go, actually, I'm, I'm starting to get a base level of knowledge. Um, last time we spoke, we were talking about the language of money. And so the language of money in terms of in the, the interpretation, some of these micro platforms is really helping with that because people have to get to a certain point um, of knowledge before they then make the, the, the big leap and invest. Um, so, so that's the one thing. But back to the point around uh, Robo. So, so Robo then assumes that, Whatever you put in what will come an output and then you can get on and execute. Um, and so the, 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 the insight there is that, you know, people want guidance and reassurance. Um, and in the end, that guidance and reassurance will come from a number of areas. Robo is one platform. Seeing your financial advisor is another platform. But increasingly, there's this kind of halfway house of information and education that it might actually take you back to the real person or it might take you into the, actually, I know I feel confident enough with my own knowledge and skills to now execute. So I think that's where it's heading. I think the insight from this is um, there was always this question about how big will the take-up of robo be? Um, well, it's still fairly small, but the numbers on our data about the people who are using it are, are seeing it sitting at around 7 8% right now, but the propensity to use has a huge runway of growth. Uh, up to around 20, 25%. So again, it's kind of one of those confidence issues, uh, I think that, that the research is telling us and that in time, it'll be more and more valuable and more and more important, but it's a bit slower to kind of get, get, get traction, if you will. Mm, fascinating. I'd like to touch on some of the more real world stuff that you picked up as well, because part of this digital uptake in my mind is people feeling like other options aren't open to them. Um, and you picked up in this research, what was it? It was, I think 55% of people under 37 were looking to buy a house really soon. And I mean, that's not, young that's uh, a huge number of people who in a lot of people's minds should already have a house by traditional standards but of course we all know our housing market is not behaving the way it has in previous years um do you think that people are maybe being pushed to look for alternatives to find financial security yeah so great point um uh new zealanders property equals financial security so if you're if you have a house, then the, the whole financial security piece plays out really strongly through the research. You know, if we think back to our learning days of Maslow's hierarchy, you know, putting a roof over your, over your head is a pretty fundamental human need. You know, it's a basic human right. So that need for security, that need for a roof over your head becomes really important. Because of the housing boom and prices rocketing so high, the question around What's the connection between the rise and rise of digital investing versus I want to buy a house in the next uh, few years for the uh, millennials, the under 37s? Um, we, we, there's a, we're speculating at the moment. We didn't ask the detailed questions around, are you making a call to invest digitally so you can save enough money to buy a house? That wasn't part of the question set. So these are more speculative causal links. 
But there's certainly no doubt that for younger New Zealanders, um, investing uh, ultimately in property is where they're going to head to. The question is how you get there uh, quickly. And the question then around investing in markets, particularly in a bull market, as we've seen in the last kind of 12 months, for a lot of people, and then the, that crypto conversation, which is, you know, I don't know if you can even call it a bull market. It's kind of a crazy market, wild ride market, but um, roller coaster you know, market. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But but being able to have um, enough of a deposit so you can actually enter the housing market um, is an interest, really interesting piece to explore, probably into our next piece of research. But you know, if if I step back from all of this and I go. Uh, and it almost comes back to that language of money piece, which is what's the purpose here? Like, what are, you know, are we? In, is money just its own end, or is it just a means to get to where we want to get to? Mm. And and helping people to unpack that and go, you know what, having a lot of money is great, and it gives you choices and whatever. But there are some fundamental goals and achievements and things that people need and want, like a roof over your heads and enough food on your table and look after your families and your kids. Like that's the essence of the money conversation. All of this other stuff is a gateway to it. Um, and so uh, what we collectively need to try and make sure that we don't lose track of is that it becomes too a uh, money conversation only and it's a snappy and jazzy and, you know, hip conversation without linking it to the point. And the point is that money is a utility that helps us do stuff and that's why it's an important conversation to have. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And on that, I mean, you mentioned earlier that you don't think that these changes are a fad. You think they might have been, you know, triggered by COVID-19, but that you see it continuing. So, I mean, how much of this do you see continuing? And do you think we'll see further growth in this space? Yeah, uh, look, uh, uh, it's, it's a bit of crystal balling. Uh, and certainly I'm just using the research to provide insight. But but when I look at the numbers of how often do you use online banking uh, apps and, and so on, and that, you know, the coverage there is now well over 90 percent. And yet that's a reasonably young market. I mean, it's not young, but, you know, it's, it's young ish. Um, and that replaced your bricks and mortar bank experience with your bank staff talking to you about stuff and you had cash and you go and make physical cash deposits like that world is almost consigned to history now, but it wasn't that long ago. So, so if, the, if the notion is that the research is telling us that the innovation cycle is getting quicker, that actually COVID has truncated that and accelerated that, which is also one of the insights from the research, and that the propensity to use and want to use is now getting material and scale, then yeah, that, that is a fundamental shift in the way things are happening. And so what that means is that that market's just going to grow. It's going to grow with market participants, with consumers, with the way people think about it. It'll ultimately be like many things. It's, it's, it's not all or nothing. It's kind of how do you blend the things together? So, you know, do we still talk to our banks for a reason? Yes, we do. Do we sometimes go and visit them? Yes, we do. But we also use their apps and we also use their platforms and we also invest and so on through them and other big institutions. With the micro platforms, which by definition have been driven and created by innovative smaller businesses, you can, you can bet your bottom dollar that a lot of people are looking at this and going, this is gonna be global, this is gonna be big, how do we join the party? Whether you're a consumer, whether you're a manufacturer, whether you're a fund provider, uh, it's kind of tapped into or untapped now a fairly large uh, opportunity for everyone and so I think that's the fundamental shift uh, and the COVID piece has given us all the time and because of our uh, our work with COVID now money because we can't spend it on trips and you know international luxuries so so people are going well I'll invest or I'll renovate my house um, or maybe I'll buy a car but what else can I do so I think those things are, uh, as a confluence of influences have been uh, amazing. And yeah, I think it's it's a point to where the future's heading. 
Fascinating stuff. All right. Thank you so much. That's Richard Clippin from the Financial Services Council. Now, if you have questions about this or any other money issue, do come and talk to me about it. I'm on Facebook, Francis Cook Journalist, Twitter, Francis Cook, Instagram, Francis Cook NZ. Send me those questions. I will try to get them answered for you on a future podcast. You can also subscribe to Cooking the Books anywhere you get your podcasts, including iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. And until next time, have a great day.